one of the things that, that I'm, I'm thinking a lot about these days is the nature in which innovative organizations and technologies have the fundamental potential to disrupt and to democratize traditional sorts of approaches to things. And I'll give a few examples before I get into my own area. Um, if you went back ten, even 10 years ago, this was the state of the art of how we organize information, manage information, get information out. Obviously, it's the case that novel technologies and novel institutions can fundamentally change that. The notion that the Library of Congress, as wonderful as an institution it is, as it is, would be fundamentally transformative and innovative uh, now seems a little bit odd. When we think about space travel, obviously this has been the domain of governments uh, for most of its time in history, but now we have innovative institutions that are coming in and trying to fundamentally change the nature of the way that we approach this, things that I think have great potential. Now when we think about this, the state of the art in my own area, which is the study of pandemics and epidemic diseases. You often will think about organizations like the WHO and CDC, wonderful organizations that I work with. But my question, one of my fundamental questions, is what will be the next fundamental ways that we address these problems? How will these systems be disrupted through technologies and institutions? How will we fundamentally change the nature of the way that we catch novel outbreaks and stop them before they spread? So about three years ago, uh, I left my cushy tenured position at UCLA as a full professor and started a company called Global Viral Forecasting and a sibling nonprofit that was associated with it. And the objective of this was to create a, an interdisciplinary home for scientists and engineers to come together and think about fundamental ways to address the problem of epidemics, how we're gonna address them, foodborne safety, all these issues related to microbial threats. And our fundamental mission is to mitigate the risks associated with these microbial threats. Um, as an organization, sort of even in our short time, these are the, the kinds of customers we've had so far. Uh, we've focused to begin with mostly on uh, governments and largely the US government, as you'll see. This is just because there's a tremendous interest, of course, in mitigating these threats. We've now started talking and reaching out to other countries and corporations, and eventually we'll be thinking about sort of a consumer approach to these things. Now, one of the things that I think is fundamental is how substantial these risks are. Uh, this may look to you like a yawning ferret, but in fact, it's actually a coughing ferret. Uh, and I think some people in the room will be very familiar with uh, a, a set of fascinating studies that have not been published yet, and these have been in the news. Uh, and these are our colleagues at, in Rotterdam, Ron Fouché, and at Wisconsin, who basically have taken H5N1, which is an, uh, also known as bird flu, which is an incredibly deadly virus, I mean, substantially more deadly than the 1918 flu, and by doing some simple passage experiments in ferrets, they've made this very deadly virus, which previously has not been seen to be transmitted in humans, to be transmissible in humans. Okay, this is something that the fact that such a virus, or not in humans, but in mammals at least, in ferrets, the fact that this virus has the capacity to spread in, in, in mammals is something we need to be very, very concerned with. I'm going to present another example of uh, this particular virus. This is an electron micrograph of H1N1, uh, also known as the swine flu. Now, I don't know how many of you in this audience uh, consider this to be sort of an over-response by the public health community. Many people in the world do. Well, I'll tell you that that perspective is completely wrong. Uh, H1N1 was a virus that went from infecting zero humans to within a year infecting roughly 10% of the human population. So if you think about this for a moment, this is like having the sort of success of impact like something like Facebook within a single year. Okay, that's how many individuals were infected by this virus. Okay, and if you think the virus didn't kill, it didn't kill, it killed a very small percentage of the individuals it infected, but it killed, uh, it's estimated over 100,000 people so far have died of H1N1. Now, and if you compare this to the number of people that died of global terrorism in the year surrounding 9-11, that was about 8,000 individuals. Okay? And if you're asking the question, you know, if many people think, okay, well, our structures were able to stop this and control this, the answer is they had nothing to do with it. The only reason why this wasn't a devastating virus was that nature handed us a virus that was not more deadly. Had it been even remotely more deadly, we'd be talking about millions of individuals that have would have died since 2009 of the H1N1 virus. And certainly natural threats are not the only threats that we face, and we alluded to this sort of in the last session with the, with the Dysons. Uh, this, is, this is a, uh, a shot of um, 
uh, Om Shinrikyo, the cult, and you can see its charismatic leader there. The charismatic leader of Om Shinrikyo uh, asked his followers to introduce an anthrax outbreak in Tokyo. Many people are not aware of this, but they basically shot anthrax off the top of a high rise in Tokyo. The only reason why it was really widely known was, in fact, uh, a number of pets died. Now, of course, the good news is they used, uh, they picked a strain of anthrax which was not particularly deadly, and they used dispersal mechanisms that were not particularly effective. But when we compare the threats associated with bioterror to things like nuclear and chemical threats, these are infinitely easier threats, and in some reason we should be asking ourselves why we haven't seen more of these things. These are fairly easy things to do. And again, uh, Terrorist threats are not the only ones that we face. And again, this was something we was talked about in the last session. Uh, what I like to refer to as bio-error, which is as more and more people have access to specimens and their specimens in freezers, the possibility that there'll be an accidental release of an existing pathogen increase. And you may think that this is something that hasn't occurred before, but if so, uh, you'd be wrong. Uh, in 1977, uh, so-called Scandinavian influenza outbreak, this is an influenza outbreak that spread around the world. And the interesting feature of it was when we looked at the genetic details of this particular virus, it was virtually identical, almost completely identical, to a virus that had disappeared about 12 years before. Okay, and what we know is that no virus persisting in nature can stay the same for 12 years. So the only reasonable explanation, and there had been a small outbreak in a US military base about two or three months earlier, was that people had broken out these old specimens and one of them infected a laboratory worker and then subsequently spread around the world. Okay, so the possibility of bio-error is really a very serious possibility. Now these are subjects that I discussed in detail in a, in a book for a general audience that I published um, in, uh, in, in late last year, and um, I, I showed this image because the German edition is gonna be published on March 9th, uh, also because the cover's a lot better than the American issue, I'm not sure why. Um, and one of the, one of the things that the, the book discusses, and I think one of the most fundamentally important features to microbes and why we face such tremendous risks from them today is that we live in this ridiculously interconnected world. This is a video which just shows daily air flights in North America alone. Um, but very recently, we lived in a world where populations were quite separate. They lived in uh, small villages, and the potential for a virus that entered into them, most of these viruses come from animals, didn't have necessarily a potential to spread. Now we live in a world where animals and humans are in this giant sort of viral mixing vessel where viruses have the potential to spread from one spot to everywhere in the world. They also have the potential to meet each other and mix and match, sort of recombining almost sexually their genes and creating novel viruses. This has shown itself uh, to have dramatic effects in the case of this uh, little villain here, or there's perhaps a little villain on this. Uh, fenugreek seeds from Egypt that were contaminated with o E. coli, subsequently germinated in France and here in Germany last year, and ended up creating the E. coli outbreak of 2011, a subject to which we're going to return later. Uh, this is an example of the chytrid fungus. This is a fungus from frogs in southern Africa. It's a, f it's a fungus that's made its way around the world on our boots and on our shoes and it's devastated global amphibian populations. In fact, uh, it's estimated that something like 20 or 30 entire species of frogs have gone extinct from the chytrid fungus. And again, this is part of this mixing feature which is creating many, many more opportunities for, for these kinds of epidemic events. And perhaps for us as humans, the most dramatic events of this, and obviously the, the most devastating, would of course be a chimpanzee virus that made its way into a hunter in Central Africa some 100 years ago and went on to spread in the late 20th century to become one of the most important biological events of, of the last century, uh, namely the HIV AIDS pandemic. Okay, so these are things that I think are very, very important, and from my perspective, they're things that we don't address in a sufficiently innovative way. If we can create a Google for the Library of Congress, we need to be able to create uh, a fundamentally innovative institution or set of institutions that can address some of these risks. And uh, th this is part of an interesting growing movement, and, and obviously one part of it is, is the organization that we started about three years ago called Global Viral Forecasting. Um, 
We're an organization that focuses on a whole range of technology. We have interdisciplinary scientists in social science and data science and microbiologists in the field. One of the fundamental things that we do is ground truthing. So we work in about 23 sites around the world along with partners uh, doing a whole range of activities. For example, uh, sampling from animal populations and screening through these animal populations to determine the diversity of viruses that are in nature that could pot potentially enter into human populations. Um, next, I'm going to show you actually a video that gives you a little bit of a sense. You may have to turn the volume up a little bit on that one. Cameroon, two hunters stalk their prey. And this just their gives you a sense of our field work. They're searching for bushmeat. Forest animals they can kill to feed their families. Patrice and Petit set out most days to go out hunting in the forest around their homes. They have a series of traps, of snares that they've set up. And they'll catch wild pigs, snakes, monkeys, rodents, anything they can, really. Patrice and Petit have been out for hours, but found nothing. The animals are simply gone. We stop for a drink of water. Then there's a rustle in the brush. A group of hunters approach. Their packs loaded with wild game. There's at least three viruses that you know about which are in this particular monkey. This species, yeah. And there's many, many more pathogens that are present in these animals. These individuals are at specific risk. Particularly if there's blood contact, they're at risk for transmission and possibly infection with novel viruses. As the hunters display their kills, something surprising happens. They show us filter paper they've used to collect the animal's blood. The blood will be tested for zoonotic viruses, part of a program Dr. Wolf has spent years setting up. So this is from this animal right here, greater spot nose guanin. Every person who has one of those filter papers has at least at a minimum been through our basic health education about the risks associated with these activities, which uh, presumably from our perspective gives them the ability to decrease their own risk and then obviously the risk to their families, the village, the country, and the world. It certainly doesn't escape me also that I'm in a hunting lodge up here. Um, but, it, but it's this interface between wild animals and humans that has a lot of potential, and believe it or not, there, there have not previously been studies to, and surveillance which aims at focusing on these two individuals. Uh, now, working with CNN and other sort of public media organizations is, is also one of the major uh, efforts that we have in our nonprofit. It's a, it's a substantial effort that we have. Uh, and if you want a slightly more entertaining version of that, you can also uh, Google me with Stephen Colbert and see me get uh, poked fun of on, on national television in the United States. Um, well, what we found out is when we put into place some of these uh, fairly straightforward techniques, but in fact techniques that hadn't been deployed, we were actually capable not only of collecting massive numbers of specimens that we could identify for novel viruses, but identifying new viruses, and not only new viruses, but catching viruses that had moved from animal populations into human populations. So this is fundamentally sort of the moment at which pandemics are born, and we were able to demonstrate that we had the capacity to look at that. Um, just to give you an example of, of what this sometimes looks like, um, many people consider Ebola virus to be a sort of a single phenomena. We think of Ebola and we imagine one virus. The reality is there's a diversity of these viruses out there in animals. And uh, often some of these Ebola outbreaks in human populations aren't even examined. What we did uh, recently is to go in and identify in detail a 2007-2000 outbreak that occurred in Democratic Republic of Congo. And what we found, in fact, was that it was a completely novel form of Ebola. It was a form of Ebola that we had never seen before. And what this means is that there's many, many other things out there that we haven't encountered yet. And I think that's probably pretty straightforward that have the potential to enter us and to cause harm. And if we go out there, we have the potential to actually see these things. Um, one of the, the major features of the nonprofit sibling organization uh, is to actually do training and to do capacity development. And if you look at um, 
This is a, a shot of one of our labs in Central Africa. Uh, this was actually before the work that we did with our colleagues in Cameroon to uh, solidify the lab. Now this is a pathogen discovery lab that's capable of processing specimens from humans and animals, and on a regular basis discovers novel agents that are crossing over into human populations. Uh, this is a, a surreal Joko, and also through the efforts of the nonprofit, we were able to train uh, Surreal, and we've trained hundreds of scientists. He worked in our partner lab in Montpellier to do his doctoral research, and now he's running our Central African laboratory facilities. Um, and uh, again, obviously, when you think of virus hunters, this may come to mind, and this is uh, actually Dr. Joseph Fair, who heads up our Washington, D.C. office and does all of our work with the U.S. government. But in fact, there's a, a brand new breed of virus hunters, and these are the data scientists. Um, and this is a group head up, headed up by Lucky Gunasakara, it's a, um, and it's based on the idea that the, the, the coming outbreaks and epidemics will first have signals in somebody's cell phone or on blogs or on open source intelligence. And this is a, uh, a spin-in startup that we, we began focusing on with inter internal development funds about two years ago. It's been in sort of heavy stealth up until uh, very recently, but it's already won things like the AMC Data Hero Award, as well as a, a Performers Award from one of the DOD organizations. Um, it's a very, very exciting organization from our perspective because it taps into the capacity of massive data sets to inform us about the health of individuals and to capture some of these events early. And one way you can think about this, and, and one of the basic features of it, is to take in information, whether this be uh, blog feeds or um, information in news articles on the open source web or proprietary feeds. In the future, obviously, could take in called data records, any source of big data to try to figure out some of these patterns. And um, I think uh, appropriate for being here in Germany is this is one of the ways that our algorithms can actually see it. This was uh, based on work that's been done in the group. And it's, from our perspective, it's very interesting because previously the only work to do any of this was based solely on keywords and it did not have a tremendous amount of success. This is based on a natural language processing algorithm and the NLP algorithm actually reads the articles and sees the various features. One of the things to note, of course, in this is that E. coli, which is of course the point of the article, isn't even one of the things that's highlighted. And the point of this is even if it's a completely unclassified event or something that doesn't mention a particular disease, which is often going to be the case early on, you still actually see it here. And when you mash up this data, um, what you can see, and this is over the course of many, many articles that have been pulled out, is you can actually see in real time what's happening in this E. coli outbreak. You can see, you pull th structured information out of it to see information on what's going on in males and females, what the age distribution is, and sort of notably from our perspective, uh, the system actually identifies these, these, these particular events substantially before they're announced by WHO and other organizations. So you can imagine the strength of combining this with the expertise in our ground truth and analytics area with the rest of the organization. Um, I'm just going to end with a few slides. Um, and, and this is actually a slide that I love. For many people in the audience, I'm sure all of you have used GIS and have thought about geographic information systems. The recognized first geographic information system was actually done by one of the first epidemiologists, John Snow. Uh, and he basically sat down and looked at the cases of cholera in London and found the relationship between these and other features. And what he saw was that it actually was contaminated pumps. And he went in and removed the handle of a pump. And one of the questions we ask in our organization is if we had John Snow in our room, if we had John Snow in the lab and in the field and in our data science labs, what kind of questions would he be asking and what would he be looking for? And I just will uh, show you uh, another feature here. And these are circles are different particular diseases. And what we've done is to compile data on articles from all these different diseases over time um, and look at them in detail to see some of the relationships and temporal patterns. And what you can see is that I think Jon Snow would be pretty happy to be alive today because we have an incredible capacity to understand the distribution and relationship between viruses, how they occur temporally, and to match that up with some of the field data we have to fundamentally change the nature of how we address these epidemics. And I'm a little over time, so I will skip to my last slide. Um, and, and I think it's uh, one of these important features to ask, because we had a, a really incredible public health 
success in the 20th century, we eliminated smallpox. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly important success. And some of us are asking the question, what's going to be the next sort of success we have? And I think we should, in the short term at least, endeavor to try to stop the next HIV. HIV is something that simmered in human populations for many decades before we were able to catch it. This is not something that we need to be able to have. And I think in the long run, we should be asking ourselves whether it may actually be possible to eradicate pandemics overall. I think that's the kind of uh, approach that we should be having to these problems. We do not have to necessarily live with these things. And I think if we put together the right sources of data and information and resources, we can accomplish that objective. Thank you very much.